Good evening. Our father had a storied career that spanned over 62 years. It began with the Army in 1955, and he continued to work through 2017. In fact, at 82, he had no plan to stop anytime soon and scheduled open heart surgery to coincide with the hiatus for Price is Right. <laughs> While begrudgingly admitting it might take a bit longer than that to recover. Dad never looked his age, and no, he didn't dye his hair. And in 2017, would still be seen carrying stacks of audio gear to and from his home studio to his car on the way to another remote. My father's career started in the Army, where he was scheduled to work on tank radios, but technically went AWOL to make his way to Washington, D.C. to apply for a job recording the Army chorus. Much to the surprise of his sergeant and himself, he got the job. After being with the Army chorus and band, he began a career in records. When Frank Sinatra was about to do his first television special since a brief retirement, he was asked to sit in on the production meeting to make sure the old man wasn't taken advantage of. It was a producer in the room who suggested that dad take over the audio portion, seeing as how he had a relationship with Frank. My father had done mostly post-production television until this point. Old Blue Eyes is Back was his first show. Once dad was established in television, he not only would help set standards, but be at the forefront of advancements in audio. He spearheaded efforts to try and get transmission standards for audio raised to make sure that what the consumer heard at least resembled the product the mixer delivered. To this day, the Screen Actors Guild Awards sends a technician to their main broadcast facility in Atlanta, Georgia, in order to monitor the inbound and outbound audio feeds, a practice he started years ago. He was known for creating near flawless audio during live television broadcasts in spite of the odds or lack of rehearsal time, and he liked it. Visitors to his booth were amazed by his real-time handling of complex shows, whether live dramas like Failsafe, The West Wing, ER, or his decades of countless award and musical television specials. He was a pioneer in 5.1 for broadcast and continued to work out the kinks and figure out why it didn't work in some network audio chains and persisted until it was fixed. Persistence was a quality Dad had. He had an incredible sensitivity to out-of-phase information not just on mic, but in speakers. I recall going to a local electronics store and watching as he made a sales clerk upset because every set of speakers they sat dad in front of were out of phase. <laughs> it was when he finally started going into the back of the speaker systems and flipping the wiring himself and making remarks like, well, at least it's in phase, but it still doesn't sound very good. <laughs> he described himself as an audio plumber and called his part of the work the execution of a concept. He was convinced that it was possible to get TV manufacturers to change their audio chip to better replicate the mixer's sound in broadcast TV. He just insisted it had to be done. Of all his professional associations, CAS was his favorite because he believed that CAS was actually making progress in optimizing audio quality across many platforms and was likely to, less likely to be caught up in professional politics. Our family appreciates the creation of the award, the, adva the advancement of sound in dad's name. He would have been humbled and flattered to have Tomlinson Holman, a colleague he respected and admired a great deal, as its first recipient. We want to thank Ed Moskowitz and the Cine Cinema Audio Society Board and President Mark Ulano for recognizing dad's contribution. We also wanted to thank Dorothy Sargent for all the hard work she did during the past few months. I would also like to thank our mom, Lynn Green, her tireless efforts and constant support of our dad, not just in the final moments, but throughout the career, throughout his career, allowed him to accomplish what he did and be the man mixing with his shoes off as we all knew and love. Thanks very much. Thank, thank you, Sam. Thank you, Grant and the entire Green family for allowing us to share your father. It's quite an honor. I'm here to share with you how this award came to be. In August of last year, as you know, the sound community lost our friend and colleague, Ed Green. Ed was many things to a huge amount of people in the industry, both locally and globally. Ed was a mentor, an instructor, an innovator, and a great friend. I want to share two photos with you. The first one is from 1980, showing his setup for 
Christmas in Washington, which, if those of you who remember Ed, demonstrates just how much tenacity he had and drive that he needed to get done what he needed to get done so that you could hear what you were supposed to hear. All very low key and without a lot of publicity. The second picture may seem a little bit humorous to some of you in the room, but many people know about how he would mix a show in his stocking feet, and only a few of you will know what that foot pedal, originally conceived from an old city bus gas pedal, is built for. It's actually another fader for us to mix in live audience reactions during the show. You heard Grant tell you one of Ed's favorite professional associations was the CAS. He was a member of the Cinema Audio Society, and it was a privilege and an honor to have him join the board in 2005. Ed's records of achievement is well known, and his ability to share his skills with others was legendary. In 2007, he was presented with the CAS Career Achievement Award. After he passed, the board of directors wanted to find an appropriate way to honor our friend and colleague. You heard from Grant how Ed fought for standards to improve broadcast television, and you heard of his abilities to execute those standards. The board entertained the idea of presenting a new award on a discretionary basis, which would be designated as the Edward J. Green Award for the Advancement of Sound. Just as the mission statement of the CAS states, we are to educate and inform the public about, the, about effective sound to advance the art of auditory appreciation, and to maintain high standards of conduct and craftsmanship among our members. The board unanimously approved the creation of this award. We use the term professionalism a lot during the discussions because it speaks to Ed's level of etiquette. Ed was what we call in Yiddish a mensch, which describes a person of integrity, honor, and humility. The board wanted someone who has a willingness to support others, share and impart knowledge with others, a personal professional decorum, and consistently presented a positive image of our craft and field of expertise to the larger entertainment community. The innovation of people like these speaks for itself. Ed was one of these people. After we made the decision to move forward, we began the task of finding a person who deserved to be presented with the new award. We knew that Ed Green was an icon in the industry. We knew that Ed Green was an innovator, even going back early to his field record, live recordings of jazz, such as Ramsey Lewis's The In Crowd or Stan Getz's Jazz Samba, for which the stories are told of him having to assemble and build the equipment he needed to accomplish making those recordings. We knew that Ed Green was an unselfish collaborator and mentor to many people, and lots of us are here in this room tonight. We knew that Ed Green wanted to affect advancements in sound. The board then, discover, then discussed who we knew that, would, that mirrored these traits. We found someone who is also a teacher of audio. We found someone who unselfishly gives of himself to mentor many people, and again, many of us are in this room tonight. We found someone who is also a recipient of the CAS Career Achievement Award. We found someone who is an innovator and an inventor as he helps to advance sound. We found someone who is also an icon in the industry. The CAS now had identified a person who mirrored Ed's traits and was also looking to the future of audio. You could almost describe them both as part of spacely sprockets. They are two complementary cogs in this huge sound machine that we all call a career. Who is this person? I'll say this selfishly if Fritz has no objection. He is our own, and he is Mr. Tomlinson Holman, CAS. Now, now I'd like to introduce a person who's a multiple Oscar, Emmy, and CAS nominee, a BAFTA award winner, and a CAS Career Achievement Award recipient himself. And joining him is a writer, cinematographer, producer, and director. 
both of who have a long and storied relationship with Tom Holman. Please welcome Jeff Wexler, CAS, and Andrew Davis. So um, I worked with uh, I worked with Tom first 47 years ago. Yikes! Did I say did I say that out loud? Um, I had just gotten my first job uh, mixing. Uh, on a low-budget, uh, non-union uh, feature film. And um, Andy was going to be the cameraman. And uh, it was supposed to be a two-man crew. And I can say two-man crew. I, now, these days, I would say two-person crew. But this was the 70s, you know. And two-man, two you know, most, most of the sound people were men. Um, Tom suggested I could, uh, I could hire his, uh, his good friend from Chicago, uh, who was, like, really into sound. And um, so I thought, well, that sounds like a good idea. Tom had been teaching film sound uh, at the University of Illinois. And uh, so I figured, uh, this is perfect. I, I had never mixed a movie before. Uh, Tom had never boomed a feature film before. So um, I was just young enough and foolish enough to know that uh, uh, I probably didn't need a boom operator, but I knew I needed a teacher. So uh, Tom came out, and um, every day on the set, uh, I would uh, ask Tom a whole series of questions, things like, on the Naga recorder, what does this switch do? What does that switch do? What's, what's the difference between low-frequency low attenuation and high-pass? Uh, what the heck is azimuth, and why is it important? Um, and Tom would always give me such great detailed answers um, uh, to all of these things, uh, and so every day I learned a little bit more about what my craft. I sort of I'd been around movies all my life um, uh, with my father on the set, uh, so I sort of knew what the sound mixer was supposed to look like he was doing, but it's just I had never done it before. <laughs> so um, uh, I do remember one day that um, Tom was um, uh, we were rehearsing a, a scene in a police station, a squad room. Um, a practical location, probably downtown LA. Uh, and um, Tom was up an eight step ladder uh, with the microphone, a fishpole, um, trying to get his cues in a scene, five speaking parts. Um, and uh, they were rehearsing, and Tom was up there doing his thing. And about halfway through the last rehearsal, you know, what I believed would be the last rehearsal, uh, Tom came down off the ladder and came over to the sound cart. And uh, he said, you know, Jeff, uh, the microphone that we're using, the AKG CK9, uh, uses an interference tube to achieve a directionality. Uh, and operating so close to the ceiling, a hard surface, I'm getting lateral reflections. It's causing an adverse response, you know, in the polar pattern. Um, <laughs> the microphone really wants to operate in a free field. I put up my hand and I said, Tom, they're going to roll the camera, get up that ladder and point the mic at the people who talk. <laughs> You know, so it was, uh, it was a situation where I think every day we both learned a lot more about uh, making movies uh, and, uh, you know, the practical reality of uh, uh, having to, you know, get up that ladder and point the mic at the people who talk. And then, uh, but I learned a tremendous amount of, of theory and concept because I, I still to this day don't know how Tom found the time during our uh, shooting. You know, it was a very, very quick, you know, but typical 15-day shooting schedule. Um, but he still took the time to give me such wonderful answers. Um, and uh, we became very good friends. And uh, uh, I'm just forever thankful for, uh, for the education and guidance that I had for Tom. It pretty much launched both of our careers. And Tom went on to do uh, a whole bunch of amazing things in um, all, all dedicated to the advancement of sound and uh, a, love for, a love for our craft. Uh, and I went on to just uh, be a production sound mixer, you know, for the last uh, <laughs> 40 plus years. So that's, uh, you know, I'm so happy that, uh, that uh, Tom is getting this award. I think it's uh, fully deserved. I'm going to try to read this. I'll, I'll go back and forth. We'll see. I think I've known Tom Holman longer than almost anyone still alive. So I want to thank the Cinema Audio Society for allowing me to speak about my dear friend tonight. Thomas and Miles Holman has given his gift to the world. 
He has allowed us to hear and see things in a fashion unheard of until Tom set the mark for contemporary audio and visual standards. Although most widely known for his creating the model for audio consistency from the dubbing stage to the theater, Tom has also established standards of light quality and sound isolation, which have allowed audiences globally to expect the full cinematic experience we filmmakers have fought for and sought to deliver. There's a bit of history about his uniqueness. It was quite a treat for me in 1964 as a freshman at the University of Illinois to meet a former electrical engineering major who had switched to communications curriculum and understood fine aesthetics and the physics of audio acoustics, sound recording, classical music, stage lighting, and set building. This is the kid who, as a classmate in Champaign-Urbana, became one of my most cherished friends and collaborators. We were not from the same background. He came from Downers Grove, an upper middle class suburb of Chicago, far away from the south side where I was reared. His father, who started as a lineman for Commonwealth Edison, became a prominent executive for the huge utility headed by Thomas G. Ayers, father of the weather underground leader, Bill Ayers. I remember working at WILL, the university's PBS affiliate behind the camera with Tom on the nightly news report for Henry Lippold, our journalism prof. We would put up magnetic clouds and rainstorms on a weather board and add minuscule stock market tally numbers. When the first two inch video recorders arrived, life had changed. There was no formal film department, but we got jobs at the University Film Unit, learning from and helping Canadian filmmaker named John Weir make propaganda films for the US Information Agency about how lovely it was for Thai students on the, our campus. We shot timeless film of soybeans growing, plus training films about how janitors could properly clean miles of hallways. We also documented the tumultuous political and cultural happenings around us from the anti-war movement, free speech, and civil rights movements to cultural and artistic breakthroughs. I remember Tom helping John Cage set up his electronic music lab across the street from where Igor Stravinsky's son taught classical music. I remember Tom capably helping Nan Porche, a famous Broadway lighting designer, set up a presentation of Gunther Schuller's The Visitation in I.M. Pei's 20,000 seat flying saucer stadium where the Illini and the state basketball championships were played. Tom was on top of it all. He taught me the brilliance of Stefan Kudelski and how in Germany you couldn't use a nagra until you could take it apart and reassemble it. How the best way to record a symphony was get a great hall and orchestra and hang the proper Neumann microphone in the right place. Tom on his own built a dubbing room in the basement of an old farmhouse with joint Army Navy projectors, Selsun motors to sync with a small bank of 16 millimeter dubbers employing Chicago World War II immigrants to wire the board. I remember going to campus screenings on Sunday night to watch Fellini, Bunuel, Bergman, and Godard in the Auditorium Theater, whose acoustics and projection were so absolutely terrible and most surely supplied the inspiration for THX. After a screening, we undergrads would listen to the Daily Illini editor, a townie named Roger Ebert, deliver his thoughts and argue with other grad students and professors. We made our first film together from Tom's recommendation, basing it on Spoon River Anthology, an Edgar Lee Masters book about a Mississippi River town. I remember Tom recording our college rock band and back then when a young local promoter named Irving Azoff us, booked us at local clubs and high school proms. Tom took a, a terrific cook, made dinner sometimes, and we watched on CBS, one of only three networks at the time, the rev revered Walter Cronkite cover the Vietnam War and cheered his announcement of US involvement. After college, I went to Chicago to find work and needed an inexpensive audio system. Tom tells me to buy a Dynaco 70 tube amp, a Thorns turntable with a Sure V15 cartridge, and two Altec Lansing Voice of the Theater speakers on sale, which I do. The summer of 1968, Tom does graduate work and teaches at iConnect as an assistant cameraman with Haskell Wexler on his feature film Medium Cool, shot during the riotous Democratic Convention. Haskell's connection to both Tom and myself, which I will explain, becomes instrumental in both our careers. I began to shoot commercials in Chicago and moved to San Francisco to be close to and work with Haskell and try to be part of Francis Coppola's zoetrope. I meet Haskell's son, Jeff, who lives nearby. We become close friends. 
Meanwhile, Haskell is helping his former student, a kid named George Lucas, shoot his first feature, THX 1138. Jeff and I work on a British documentary about two-time Nobel Prize winner Linus Pauling, and Tom comes out to the Bay Area to help with sound recording. Tom moves to Champa from Champaign to Boston to work with the, au the audio guru Henry Kloss at KLH. He meets his life partner, a brilliant young man named Fritz Koenig. Haskell rec recommends me to DP a small feature for Roger Corman's brother, Gene, and Tom comes to LA and does boom work for Jeff, who is now becoming a serious production mixer on a black action version of Asphalt Jungle for MGM called Cool Breeze. Haskell shoots American Graffiti, which is a huge success, allowing uh, George Lucas to create the opportunity to make Star Wars. Dolby recommends Tom now, living in Cambridge, Mass, to George Lucas, and he moves to the Bay Area. Tom builds for Lucas the dubbing rooms in San Rafael for Star Wars. The creation of a new cinema begins, cinema standard begins. Tom joins, THX joins a Tom Holman experiment crossover with Lucas's first film title. In 1977, Tom helps record live 16 track music and does boom work in a freezing Chicago weather when I make Stony Island my first film as a director. We mixed Stony Island at Samuel Golden stages with Bill Varney and Bob Litt. This was when mixers could be smoking at, all day at the board in a dubbing room that had just installed rock and roll capability but still had used the hated Simpty roll-off. <laughs> Audio devices and theaters everywhere carry its moniker. After Tom de designs and supervises the build of Skywalker Ranch audio facilities, including the scoring stages, he and THX become names that are world-renowned. I get to write a letter recommending his full professorship. His students become new, the new generation of Hollywood. Apple calls. Can Tom recommend someone to head up their audio area? Well, he says, what about me? Tom now goes to work for the largest corporation in the world and can't discuss anything he does with his closest friends. And Tom now goes to work uh, but I'm told that he fixed the color spectrum on their monitors so that the purple glow of lowriders' vehicles is now absolutely correct. <laughs> he and THX become legend, one of the most recognized film acronyms known. At the, 20th century, at the 20th anniversary of the Fugitive Screening, it is such a pleasure for me to see Tom interact and be so respected by the Academy-nominated sound crew of Don Mitchell, Frankie Montano, Mike Urbick, and Scott Smith, who told me that the Fugitive won the first feature film award from CAS. On a personal note, it has been a true pleasure for my family and my wife, Adrienne, to have enjoyed hosting and spending time with Tom and Fritz on many holidays over the years. This is from a letter I was able to write supporting Tom's full professorship at USC. In another era, Tom would be likened to inventors such as Edison, Tesla, and Bell. In our modern culture, innovations leap forward at breakneck speed, and the authors of new technologies are less celebrated. Whether they know him by his name or not, virtually everyone in the developed world has been affected by Tom's ingenuity, dedication to his profession. And a final story in closing. Tom took his Apple team last Thursday night to San Francisco to view his former student, Ryan Coogler's Black Panther, which was stage managed by a man he trained at USC, dubbed at Skywalker Sound, which he created and mixed in the facility. He designed and built and shown, it was in, and, he was, and the film was shown at the AMC Kabuki Theater that Tom set up, which was unchanged and sounding great many years later. Congratulations, Thomas and Miles Holman. You still rock. Your life and career have become full circle. I'm overwhelmed, and I need my prompter. <laughs> thank you. Uh, thank you to the board of directors for developing a memorial award named for Ed Green and bestowing it on me. It's obvious. I couldn't be more honored. I'm sharing the podium tonight, though, with other giants. Anna Belmer, you couldn't know, but you've had a profound effect on me. 
Congratulations. Your mix of Avita caused the Cinerama Dome to fix its cross echoes that had always been there up until that show. <laughs> Although fixing it deprived me of a story that was going into my book, it had to be revised because it was no longer a story. And that mix, as I heard it there, stuck with me. And I've found bugs in distribution chains since then because I know what it sounds like. And that honors you. Joe Wright, thank you. Thank her. Joe Wright, you are quoted in Hollywood Reporting, Reporter saying, sound is 50% of the experience. So I can give up always having to quote George Lucas on that. <laughs> you talked there about your thinking about sound while shooting and your close collaboration with your sound mixer, which is what we always hoped we would instill in students as a sound professor. There's a moment in Darkest Hour where Winston is sitting alone at Checkers and we hear just some distant footsteps on the stairs that stays with me. What a storytelling moment. He's so alone. I also have to thank about 3,000 students I taught in 25 years, some of whom are here tonight and about 50 of whom actually made it full-time into sound. Two a year, not bad. I, like all others here probably, were profoundly influenced by the people we started out with. It's hard to believe I've known Andy Davis for 52 years and he gave me my first, second, and third <coughs> professional jobs and that Jeff Wexler, CAS, is here on the board and did that, throw, uh, that third pro gig with me in 1972. Many of us here are backed up at home in a difficult industry and we have partners to thank from the bottom of our hearts. I have been for 38 years with Fritz Koenig, my spouse. <laughs> and it's even been legal for the last two and a half years. <laughs> Perhaps the greatest honor tonight should go to Ed Green, whose family is here. A consummate professional and a gentleman's gentleman, he was especially kind to me, offering up his tight quarters so that I could observe his unique skill in practice. Thank you very much. <laughs>